Okay, well, today's Bible scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And you can follow along on the screen behind me or read it in your own Bibles. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. This is God's word. As I was thinking about this passage all through the week, I was making some connections in my mind. Um, connections that might not be apparent at first. I actually thought in my mind of an old Christmas carol text. It's one that we sing every year. It was written by Philip Brooks in the middle 1800s. And I wanted to splash these words up on the screen behind me and just have you think about what the hymn writer, Philip Brooks, was getting at as he wrote these lines. He wrote, Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still! We see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And I was trying to, what is he saying? What is he trying to express in very poetic language? I was thinking about how we tend to be oblivious so often to the really important things. We're living our lives, we're maybe sleeping the night away, and while we are oblivious, something magnificent is happening. And I think this is what Mr. Brooks is getting at here. All of the hopes and the dreams and the fears of humanity a huge matter was being addressed by God while the town was sleeping. Yet in thy dark streets shines the everlasting light. And I was just thinking what a challenge it is for us to remember at Christmas time that this quiet, humble birth was God coming among us, addressing an issue of cosmic proportions, if you will. And also, we tend to forget that this Christ child who came so silently, so unassumingly into Bethlehem, has also promised to come again, but in a quite different way. He's going to come in a way that at that time will make manifest and unmistakable the kingdom of heaven, which so many of his parables taught about. He will come and it will be obvious and undeniable. Yet Jesus did have what we call a first advent. And we celebrate it every year at this time. That arrival is history. It has come and gone. And yet there is coming a second advent of Jesus. Now when we think of that sweet newborn baby Jesus in a manger, it's hard for us to imagine the splendor and the power and the glory and the might that will be expressed when this same Jesus comes again. When he first came, the arrival was virtually under the radar. Practically no one saw it coming, and hardly anybody knew that he, that he had come. 
and the world raced on, busied with its nose, buried in business as usual, clueless to the fact that, as Mr. Brooks wrote, the hopes and fears of all the years were being met in those streets that night while the world slept. <laughs> and while this humble entrance of Jesus is very heartwarming and beautiful to us as we remember Christmas, it also makes me think about something else. It makes me think about how unmindful we human beings can be to what really matters, how oblivious we can be to the most important things. And I think that's largely what Mr. Brooks was driving at when he wrote that first stanza. Now, it was this propensity in us, guys, that Jesus warned his disciples about in this parable that was read for you just a few moments ago. The parable that's known traditionally as the parable of the ten virgins. But virgins is kind of an, you know, an ill-advised translation because what it really meant was unmarried young women. And these women happened to be attendants at a wedding celebration. So we probably better translate it now as the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids. Because that gets the gist of what was being spoken of in the parable. Now, Jesus began that story with words that are sort of a formula that you've been seeing over and over again as we've been looking at the parables of Jesus one by one. Look how he started the parable. This is verse 1, the first part of it, Matthew chapter 25. He said, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like dot, dot, dot. And he goes into the story. Now, the first thing I want you to notice, don't miss it, at that time. What time is he referring to? You've got to be able to address that question. Otherwise, you're not going to understand the parable. Now, I will, be t I will tell you that Matthew was helpful. In that chapter 24, verse 3, he actually told us what time Jesus is speaking of. So we'll put this up on the screen for you. Here's what Matthew 24, verse 3 says as it gives the setting for the telling of this story. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Don't miss that. He's telling this in private to his disciples. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? Now, if you read the entire context, you realize that they are asking Jesus, when will transpire what he just told them was going to transpire? They were marveling at the temple, the temple that took 60, 70, 80 years to build. Marvelous. It was one of the wonders of the world. And Jesus was said, there's coming a day, you guys, when not one stone of this temple will be left standing on top of another. And the, the disciples are looking at each other going like, what? How in the world? This is one of the wonders of the world. There's no temple like this anywhere on the face of the earth. And they're asking themselves, how can this be? Why would you say this, Jesus? When? Now, look at their question. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? Notice the association there. They associate this destruction of the temple with the coming of Jesus and of the end of the age. They're linking all these things together. They're thinking all of this is somehow rolled together. This return of Jesus that they are already thinking of while Jesus is still walking and talking among them. And they said, we want to know when. How will we know? What will the signs be like? And so it's an answer to that question that Jesus gives his most extensive record. I'll put it this way. The most extensive recorded teaching from Jesus on his second advent. As a matter of fact, his answer swallows up all of chapter 24 and all of chapter 25. And this parable... The parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids forms a part of his response in answer to that question. Now, when Jesus comes again, that second advent will catch people, I'll use the phrase catch people, in a variety of different postures, Jesus teaches. Cue the parable. The parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids. Now, you got to know that this parable was grounded in the marriage customs of Jesus' culture. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I, I've been around a lot of weddings. I've done a lot of weddings. And it's interesting that when you do a wedding that has some cross-cultural element to it, you get all of these different twists on a wedding. We have a wedding that's going to transpire in my family in just a couple of weeks. And, there is, uh, and the groom is of Hispanic background. 
And there are things that are going to happen in this wedding and the time around the wedding that are like, whoa, that's not a part of our culture, but it's a part of their culture when they celebrate weddings. Different cultures celebrate weddings in all kinds of different ways, but a couple of things remain consistent. In other words, always, no matter what culture you're talking about, marriage is a huge event. And I would also tell you that marriage is something to be celebrated regardless of the culture, regardless of the specific cultural expressions. And so I've told you before that in Jesus' day, when they threw a wedding, they threw a wedding. I told you that sometimes a wedding celebration would last as long as a week. And, of course, then you insert into the picture the fact that Jesus chose a wedding feast to do that miracle where he turned water into wine, the sort of sanctifying a wedding, if you will, and as if he were saying, this celebration deserves to go on. We're keeping this going. I am the Lord of the feast. Let the celebration go. So it's a wedding that Jesus is using to picture what it will be like when he comes again. Now, in Jesus' day, the bridegroom, when it came wedding day, would leave his home along with an entire entourage of people. His family, his friends, groomsmen, I guess, if you will. And he would journey, journey with this entourage to the home of the bride where he would meet the woman to whom he's been betrothed for quite some time already. And betrothal was a little bit more significant than what we call engagement today. Betrothal actually had to be terminated by a legal act, almost like a divorce would be that's how much more serious betrothal was in Jesus time now of course when the bride would arrive when the bridegroom would arrive at the home of the bride the bride had her own entourage she had a party waiting with her and they were waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom when the groom would draw near his arrival would be announced with great pomp with great fanfare by a herald and that announcement could be heard echoing through the streets as the procession was drawing near. Now together, when the bridegroom arrives with his entourage, the bride and her party go out to meet him. And they form one doubly sized entourage. And they go celebrating and partying through the streets of the town back to the home of the bridegroom where the wedding would take place. Kind of a cool cultural picture, isn't it? It's really exciting. Boy, it's festive. There's, 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 there's joy involved in it. Now, here's the catch, though. No one knew exactly when the bridegroom would arrive, especially if he didn't live in town. It was a bit of an issue. You couldn't text. Be there in five minutes. No, you didn't have that. And so, actually, this sort of turned into part of the celebration. It was, they made a party game out of it. I will call it the catch the bridal party unaware game and it added to the fun it added to the celebration of wedding day let's see if we can catch the bridal party unprepared and this sort of became part of the culture it was a cultural game now as i've said i've done a bunch of weddings in my day and most of them have not been punctual very rare has been the wedding that i had done that actually started on time in fact, I've done weddings where the bride did not even show up until 45 minutes after the processional was supposed to begin. I'm serious. This is, this, is, this is funny. And I thought, okay, I will tell you this. I've never had a groom wait for the wedding. He's never been late. But the brides are, I'm, I'm just saying. And I'm wondering if this is not cultural payback for all of the brides that were kept waiting by bridegrooms in Jesus' day. It's cultural payback. There you go. But I do think that I would have a hard time doing weddings in Jesus' day because I'm a very scheduled person and I don't do well with surprises. So don't try to surprise me because I might smack you. Okay? I just don't respond well to surprises. So I'd have probably stroked out if I were doing weddings in Jesus' day because of this game, the cultural aspect of the, of the bridegroom never really conveying exactly what time he was going to arrive for the bride. Now, against that cultural backdrop, I want you to look at the meat of Jesus' story. Verses 6 through 10, Matthew 25. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Now, can you see it? 
Can you see it? What time of day? Midnight, okay? Wow, he really did make them wait. All day long, all evening long, they've waited. They've gone to bed. They've retired. And at midnight, the cry rings out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. While they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. That's like fast forwarding the processional winding its way back to the groom's home. And the door was shut. Now, I think it's fairly obvious that a key element of this story that Jesus told is this varied behavior among the bridesmaids with regard to the coming of the groom. I think that's what he wants us to focus on here. Some of the bridal attendants behaved in a way that he calls wise. And some of the bride's attendants behaved in a way that he calls foolish. Now, here's how Jesus described it. This is verse, verses 2 through 4. He said, five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they didn't take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now, guys, I think that Jesus means for you and me to walk away from the hearing of the story and be talking to ourselves, saying things like this. What were these unwise girls thinking? They brought lamps, but no fuel to power them. What good is a lamp if you don't have fuel to light it and keep it burning? We're supposed to be asking ourselves the question. How could they have been so careless? How could they have overlooked something so important? I mention somewhat frequently that I do like to backpack the Appalachian Trail. And sometimes we're out for days on end. And I actually have a little tiny backpacker's stove. You wouldn't believe it if you saw it. If you've never seen one, this is amazing. It's, uh, it's about the size of a Bunsen burner, actually. Okay, actually, you, you, if you picture a Bunsen burner in your mind, you probably have an idea, but except this is collapsible. Literally, when it's folded up, it's this, it's this tall, and it's about this big around. So, very, very tiny little thing, and it weighs just ounces. Okay? Now, the thing of it is, is that it doesn't have any fuel. You also have to carry a canister of fuel. And believe me, when we're going to be on the trail for an extended period of time, you have a list of things that you need to take with you because there's no 7-Eleven on the trail, okay? You go through that list several times to make sure that you have not left anything important out because if you don't have fuel for your stove, you're going to either have to eat stuff cold or just go hungry. And that's just not very much fun, okay? So believe me, I double-check the list over and over again and I make sure that I've got fuel and stove. What good is a camping stove if there's no fuel to run it? So I think Jesus is painting a picture here of what I would call a lack of sobriety. Now, that doesn't mean the the converse of being drunk. Sober-mindedness. A failure to take things seriously enough to actually invest forethought and be prepared. It reminds us that we tend to live life with our attention focused only on what is right in front of our faces to such an extent that we don't see what's beyond those things because what's in front of our faces always seems so much more significant and real to us. And that's a foolish way to live. Now, I've got uh, a bunch of grandkids, and the youngest one is not yet a year old. And we had a deal that with Tessa and Max that whenever I would talk about them in a sermon, I'd have to give them some money. I don't remember what the rate was, but it's probably gone up since then. But they're not here to know, so don't tell them. Anyway, (laughs) my new grandson that lives in Nebraska is still of that age where if he gets a hold of something that you don't want him to have, you don't have to fight to get it from him. All you got to do is, hey, look here. And he goes, huh. And he just forgets what he was doing, and he goes off to whatever it is that you're showing him. All you got to do is distract him. 
Okay? Parents, don't you wish it was always that way with your kids? Dad, I'd like to borrow the car. Uh, look here. No, it doesn't work that way. And in fact, probably Samuel is getting past the point where I could probably do that with him. He probably is a little bit smarter than that now. But it was not so with these foolish girls in Jesus' parable. They seem to be about an inch deep. Okay? Can I just say it? My guess is that these bridesmaids, bridesmaids were having a really great time enjoying the party, celebrating with the bride as they awaited the groom's arrival. But they had not taken care of business. They had not tended to the things that mattered in the bigger picture. They were ditzy. They were lightweights, and they remind me of the kind of life philosophy that you see in a Bud Light commercial. These foolish girls were consumed with immediate things, fun times, so much that they had, they had no inclination and no capacity to think about the important things. And the end result, when you live that way, guys, is that you don't think about what ultimately matters, and you wind up getting caught unprepared. And when it comes to eternal, spiritual, kingdom of God type issues, that is unspeakably tragic. So you and I must not live superficial lives, being too shallow to think about the things of eternity. Look on the screen. The bridegroom has promised to return for us. And when he does, he wants to find us thoroughly in love with him, thinking about him, and living lives that reflect a commitment to him, even while it appears to us that he's absent. Now, there's another theme that I saw in this parable. Okay, listen for it as I reread verses 8 through 12. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Now think about that. Does that seem a little harsh? Does that seem a little selfish to you? It can come across that way at first, but actually it's wisdom. I mean, this is a midnight procession through streets that don't have street lights. Okay? What are you going to do? You're going to spread your oil so thin that all of you will have light for about five minutes, but you got a ten-minute journey? Wouldn't it be better to have at least five torches that actually burn the whole way? Well, the wise ones realize this, so they know there's not going to be enough for all of us. So if you want oil, you're going to have to go get some oil. Now, the passage continues. Instead, they said, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Now, here's where you can see that the story of Jesus has veered away from traditional real wedding. I doubt that there would have been bridesmaids that were completely unknown to the bridegroom. Here, Jesus takes the story and it sort of extends it out a little bit. And he's making a bigger picture here. Now, I think that these foolish girls are also meant then to be a picture for us of what I'd call a lack of personal responsibility. They say to themselves, it won't matter, it's no big deal, we run out of oil, we run out, if we do, we just depend upon somebody else, we just borrow some oil. This seems to be the mindset if they thought about it at all. And it led me to this conclusion, I'll put this on the screen for you, you cannot depend on someone else's relationship to Jesus. Now, that's important, because I think we try to do that. We don't want to deal with it personally, but we will hang around people, maybe they have something going on spiritually, which is a good thing to do as long as you are tending to your, yourself in that regard. In other words, here's, I'll say it again. You cannot depend on someone else's relationship to Jesus. You have to be wise enough to prioritize spiritual health for yourself, even if nobody around you is going to do it. You cannot ride on somebody else's coattails. Now, Jesus himself brings the parable to a conclusion and makes the main point front and center. And this is verse 13. So he actually tells you what he wants you to know at the end of this. He says this, Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know the day or the hour. 
What was the question? When will these things happen? What will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? And he says, keep watch because you won't know. Guys, so many people have what I will call flashes of interest in Jesus. I don't know if you would consider yourself in that category or whether you've noticed that that happens sometimes. Flashes of interest in Jesus. In certain times, they will burn very hot. But at other times, they are to be found as absolutely cold as they used to be hot. And sometimes when I encounter that and I'm, and, and, and I'm on my own and in my head, here's what's going through my mind. I'm thinking to myself, when will you take yourself in hand and do what must be done to develop a steady, life-dominating relationship with the coming bridegroom? Now, that is crucial. You must be forward-thinking enough to do this. Develop a life-dominating relationship with the one before whom every knee will bow. You can't say, well, I just didn't think of it. You can't say, well, I'll just lean on somebody else. This is kind of what the parable is saying. This parable urges you and me to keep watch, to live vigilantly. Jesus is the king of the world. And although we cannot observe this visibly at present, there is coming a day when it will become fully visible. And in the meantime, you and I must live here as though it is fully manifest already. Our allegiance must be intentional. Our allegiance must be total. And our allegiance must be practiced. So as we focus this season on the first advent of Jesus, which came so quietly, so humbly, so under the radar, don't be so foolish as to forget the connection between the first advent and the second advent. Let us live our lives intentionally under his lordship and be found fully engaged in this world as though he may arrive at any moment. Now that would be a good practice as we celebrate Christmas. Keep those connected. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for what we celebrate at this time of year. It is spectacular, and I marvel, as Mr. Brooks did, when I think about what transpired at the coming of Jesus. And, and I also am made, I guess I'll use the word sober-minded. I'm sobered by the fact that we so often tend to miss what is important because we're so busy focusing on things that are right in front of our faces. And I guess I would like to ask for this congregation of people that at this Christmas time, we wouldn't be caught sleeping that we would be fully aware of what we are celebrating when we celebrate the first advent of Jesus. And that we'd be smart enough to realize where all of this leads. Father, what you have done for us in giving us Jesus is breathtaking. It is, there are not, there are not words to describe it adequately. Especially when we realize that this is the king of all the ages. Is this eternal God wrapped up in the skin of a human baby who came and he gave his life that we might be made right with you forever? How could we be so foolish as to neglect that important matter? Lord, we must know you. We must trust you. We must receive the gift of reconciliation with you that you've made possible in this little baby. Lord, help us to remain awake and vigilant for another coming of this same Jesus. Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you for the gifts and the passions that you've given to them. I thank you for all of the things that comprise their lives, some of which are good, some of them are which some of them are which, some of them which are very difficult and challenging in these present days. Help them to walk with you in these days. Thank you for giving us the occasion to meet together and to celebrate the birth of Jesus this morning and not to limit ourselves to just the birth of a baby, 
but to realize what this is about. I communicate to you my love now. And on behalf of these people, I offer you our love and our commitment. Thank you for the children this morning who, who prepared us by, by sort of reading and enacting this incredible story. And I thank you for the musicians who helped us to direct our thoughts in this direction through song. Help us to live it out now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.